Let's talk about what has happened today. So 43 ministers sworn in, 36 of them new, 7 have got promotions, 12 have been asked to leave and have been shown the exit sign. What is the overall message? Let's quickly break it down before we start the discussion and get our experts to analyze what has happened. So number one, it's clear that perform or perish is a message that has gone out to all the ministers, old and new, since senior names, uh, which were not really expected so far, like Ravi Shankar Prasad, Dr. Harsh Vardhan, uh, Prakash Javrekar, had to resign. These are stalwarts of the BJP who are no longer part of the Council of Ministers. So it's a stern message for the upcoming crop of ministers as well. Allies have been given space this time around in the backdrop of key allies like Shirumani Akali Dal and the Shiv Sena leaving the BJP side since the 2019 general elections. So LJP, Apna Dal and JDU find a place in the Council of Ministers. There's also a very clear bet on young blood and new faces. So there are 14 ministers below the age of 50. Doctors, lawyers, engineers have made the cut and the average age of the cabinet has gone down from 61 to 58. There's also wider representation in government this time around. Women, OBCs and state representation has been seen. Uh, a lot of faces from the Northeast, UP, Karnataka, Maharashtra have all gotten representation but what is the backdrop what is the context is this sort of a re-evaluation in the middle of the second term where all eyes are now on 2024 remember it's coming in the backdrop of a global pandemic people have suffered lives have been lost livelihoods have been lost economy is struggling incomes are hit and the government is definitely facing the heat it is a message to say that they're listening are willing to reboot and look at new ways of solving the problem. Now, having said that, the big question remains about who gets what? What do you do with this new lot of ministers? Madhavan Narayanan on the show today. Sanjeev Srivastav joins us, as does Yashwant Deshmukh. Smita Gupta will be speaking to us this evening, as well as Amitabh Tiwari. Welcome to all of you, and thank you so much for joining us today. Yashwant, a lot of polls, including yours, have shown that people were getting a bit disenchanted with the Modi government because of the pain that they suffered uh, due to COVID-19. Do you think that cognizance has been taken of those sentiments? And that's why quite a harsh axing of key ministers. I mean, the change of the health minister in the middle of a pandemic gives a very clear message, doesn't it? I think uh, uh, we can notice the political messaging very strongly in this uh, uh, change. And uh, to be honest, uh, uh, I and many other analysts were expecting this to be more of a firefighting thing, but this has gone beyond firefighting. It is, if it was only Dr. Harshwadhan who was dropped, then it would have made news accordingly that, you know, uh, that due to COVID pandemic and the failures and other things, uh, uh, health minister was dropped. But with six major, uh, I mean, other senior cabinet ministers also being dropped, uh, uh, Dr. Harshwadhan becomes also one of those who has been dropped. So while, yes, uh, the pandemic thing and, uh, and, and the failure in, 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 in managing the pandemic has been uh, a key thing in these, uh, these changes, but at the same time, uh, uh, very smartly, these changes have been made in such a giant way, in a huge way, that it becomes as a part, of, part and parcel of a much bigger exercise. Uh, which is very, very politically smart and uh, extremely carefully adjusted at the at the grassroots uh, level equation in terms of real politics. So, uh, so yes, what you are saying that is that is certainly is the fact. But it is also the fact that uh, that a big number of changes have been brought in to 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 keep in account of the electoral realities of the elections which uh, we are going to see in the next three years and 2024 elections as the big one. So a lot many changes have been brought in. And I guess that uh, if you go into the minutest details of what, who has got in, what kind of changes have been done, you will realize that this is, uh, this is way beyond just uh, uh, being, a, uh, being a firefighting mechanism for what has gone wrong during the COVID pandemic. Yeah. 
No, absolutely. There is much more to it, no doubt. Sanjeev Srivastava is it also ushering in the next generation of BJP leaders, also sending out a message internally that patience is rewarded, whether it's Jyotiraditya Sindhya, who made a major move over a year ago, or Sarbanan Sonowal, who stepped down as chief minister of a state that he got back into power. See, uh, Tamanna, good evening. Uh, first of all, whatever uh, Yashwant Deshmukh just said, I mostly agree with him. Even your intro, that it's part like a reboot, listening to criticism, all that is, a, yes, completely agree with that. I think if you use a cricketing analogy, then the what the government has done, it is it has taken a fresh card, in a manner of speaking. And taken a fresh card in a manner that everybody sees it. It's like a new beginning. In 2.0, it is 1.0. So I think the message the Prime Minister is trying to send is, okay, we accept the criticism which has happened. There was this perception that the government is a bit adrift and things are not as... Uh, the, the hands on the deck are not as uh, calibrated and as as well machined and well oiled as expected to be. So all that has been taken into account and a fresh beginning is being attempted. And for that, all the right kind of messaging has happened. The fresh beginning, like Ashwin said, it is regional caste equations, uh, the age factor, like you mentioned, and good number of technocrats. You know, the, the Vaishnavs of the world, IAS, Wharton School, IIT, number of lawyers. So the, the, an attempt is that this is a government which means business. At the same time, the bigger message really is in the sacking. Apart from the inductions, we'll know what, how the induct, new inductees will perform, who will get which portfolio. But the sacking has set, set out a big message. You know, Harshwardhan, like uh, Yashwan said, Harshwardhan becomes a lightweight in comparison to a Prakash Javdekar or a... Ravi Shankar Prasad, with all respects to Ms. Dr. Harshwardhan. Uh, so, what is the messaging again? That you have to have your finger on the pulse of the people. When the people are angry, when the janta is angry and you're getting a flak, you can't be flaring your nostrils and appear to be a bigger angry young man on screen while talking to uh, media or ad addressing people. So, though, you know, arrogance has also been, I think, a little bit punished. So, it's a it's a very careful, very deft exercise, and I and Mr. Modi, you know, sometimes it gives you an impression as if he is in some ivory tower, not knowing what's happening. But again, this exercise gives a clear hint that this combination has their ear to the ground. They know how to do the course correction, at least attempt a course correction, whether it happens in the right spirit, we'll know in the coming months. So, um, a good young team, solid messaging, both politic and governance wise. And now let's see who gets which portfolio and um, then one can talk more about it really. Yeah. That's the big one. That's the big one. Who gets what? Now, let's just play out for you what some of those uh, new uh, ministers, the new inductees had to say. Uh, they gave some sound bites after the whole oath taking ceremony. Listen in. केंद्र में अगर आप देखिएगा तो हम लोग एनडीए का हिस्सा है और इसमें भारतीय जनता पार्टी खुद अपने आप में बहुमत है ये तो प्रधानमंत्री जी की समझिए कि जो इसको कहते हैं ना कि उनकी उदारता है कि भाई उन लोग जितने भी उनके साथ जुड़े हुए हमारे एनडीए के भी हैं और भी हैं उन सब लोगों को उसमें रखा है एक संदेश है उसमें देखिए आप हर एक जगह जोड़ घटाव गुना भाग और फॉर्मूला नहीं कर सकते अभी कोई मुद्दा नहीं है जी अभी सिर्फ जो विश्वास प्रधानमंत्री जी ने अमित भाई ने नड्डा जी ने और पार्टी के अन्य सीनियर लोगों ने मुझ पर दिखाया है उसके लिए आभार प्रकट करना चाहती हूँ धन्यवाद देना चाहती हूँ और जो जिम्मेवारी मिलेगी उसे ईमानदारी से पूरा किया जाएगा आदरणीय प्रधानमंत्री जी को धन्यवाद देता हूँ भरोसा जताया है और अपना कैबिनेट में शामिल किया और मेरे क्षेत्र के जनता अरुणाचल प्रदेश के लोग जिन्होंने मुझे चुनकर एमपी बना करके भेजा उनके प्रति मैं आभार प्रकट करना चाहता हूं भारत माता को मोदी जी की नेतृत्व में इस देश को दुनिया का सर्वश्रेष्ठ राष्ट्र के हिसाब से हमें खड़ा करनी होंगे तो इसलिए मुझे लगता है कि हम सबको मिलकर 
अगले दिनों में हमको काम करना होगा तो इसी विश्वास से मैं सबको फिर से दो बड़ा धन्यवाद देता हूं जिम्मेदारी देते हैं वो डेडिकेशन के साथ डिसिप्लिन के साथ डेवलपमेंट के साथ और काम करने वाले हैं आने वाले दिन में जो भी प्रधानमंत्री जी आदरणीय प्रधानमंत्री जी जिम्मेदारी देते हैं वो काम और डेडिकेशन के साथ काम करेंगे आशा करता हूं और प्रयास करूंगा कि उनकी आशाओं के अनुरूप खरा उतर सकूं और संभव प्रयास किए जाएंगे कि मोदी जी के नेतृत्व में देश जिस तरह से दुनिया में एक अपना नया स्थान कायम कर रहा है उनके नेतृत्व में देश और तरक्की करे जो भी जिम्मेदारी मिलेगी उसको अच्छी तरह से निभाते हुए प्रयास करेंगे कि जनता की सेवा की जा सके और भारत जिस तरह से दुनिया में अपनी नई छाप बना रहा है मोदी जी के नेतृत्व में उसमें हम सब लोग और योगदान दे सके Madhavan, have you made your uh, little sheet of who you think should fill in these key positions, especially health, education, IT, INB? Uh, who are the contenders from the new list? Who you think will make the cut? Remember, um, seven ministers have actually been given an elevation as well, so they could be in for uh, some big postings. Well, Tamanna, this is not something I was thinking rigorously about because I was still taking in the whole exercise. But two names did occur to me. I thought, in a very, uh, you know, uh, uh, slightly wicked way, perhaps. But if Mother uh, Jyotira Desidya is given her health ministry, it would be a case of handing over the toughest job to the smartest guy, because he is the smartest one around. All said and done, unless you're talking about Ashwini Vaishnav. Uh, and I also thought that Hardeep Singh Puri might make a good information and broadcasting minister because he is very articulate, balanced, and comes from an IFS background. And there is a balancing act to be performed when you want to be, uh, you know, sort of lording over the media while recognizing that the media is not something that you lord over from a government's point of view as uh, breathing down the neck. So um, he has that mix of confidence and grace, which I thought would fit in. I haven't really thought about the other ministries yet, uh, you know, Tamana. But I would uh, say that Anurag Thakur is somebody who will probably be okay in any ministry. I don't uh, think he's a domain expert in any way or in terms of style. But I would still be keenly watching out for Ashwini and uh, Jyotiraditya Sindhya because they I regard as competent. And I would also watch out for Rajiv Chandrasekhar. Who, if he is given something like IT, which uh, uh, you know Ravi Shankar Prasad has left, it would be appropriate because uh, he has a strong background in IT. But having said that, as somebody who has been the financier of a leading pro-government, uh, far-right kind of a channel, I would be watching keenly, and I hope not he would be given the INB ministry. But uh, th that's it then from a ministry point of view. If you have something specific to guess, I might make my thoughts on it. These are the ones on which I've already formed my thoughts. But uh, it is going to be very interesting because especially health and labor will be keenly watched, you know. Yeah. You know, what it also tells you is how the focus needs to be placed on these key ministries, health and education, health, education, labor. Look at um, the issues that we're facing right now. COVID-19 pandemic has bared the chinks in India's health system badly. How, uh, you know, the health infrastructure is really crumbling and we felt the heat of it. The disparity between the haves and the have-nots came to the fore. Likewise, with education, you have a new education policy to deal with and to actually implement and roll out. Unemployment rates and increased automation brings up huge challenges for the Labour Ministry, which was sort of just, you know, dawdling along all of these years. Uh, Smita Gupta, in, in your view, what would you hope to see from the Modi 2.0 new version government after all of this rejig in terms of actually executing some of the things that they promised to do? Well, you know, uh, what we saw today was a huge, huge image-building exercise. But 
of course, the key question is how is that going to translate into governance and addressing the very issues that you're talking about, about how it will address the issues of lost jobs, how it will address the issue of, you know, the rising, uh, rising prices, the economy, uh, the fact that the education sector has been also hit by the pandemic very, very severely, apart from its other problems. That only time will, uh, you know, we'll have to, uh, I would like to see uh, uh, a, who, who is assigned which ministry, uh, because sometimes ministries are handed out in terms of importance, uh, not necessarily to the fittest person. So one will have to watch and see who gets what portfolio. Uh, and uh, one would also like to see whether there will be some degree of decentralization within the within the government, because in the last seven years we have seen uh, Mod uh, Mr. Modi, uh, you know, controlling the government uh, very very tightly. All decisions have been centralized. There hasn't been that much leeway given to individual ministers to exercise their own initiative. So you know, like somebody was talking about, say, a Jyotiraditya Sindhya. Would he, if he uh, was given an important portfolio, would he be allowed, for instance, to exercise his own initiative? Or would it, uh, you know, he would have to sort of toe the line as it were? Because that has been, I think, a key problem so far, as far as governance is concerned in this government, that when you centralize too much, there is only so much even the most talented person can do. There has to be a certain amount of uh, uh, democratic functioning within the government. The other thing that struck me was that with the uh, sure a lot of uh, people who have come in, you know, are sporting uh, PhDs, there are a larger number of well-educated people, uh, uh, younger people, uh, which always brings in hope. Uh, but will they make good ministers? I mean, somebody who has a PhD, uh, that, will he be a good administrator? That is one. And the second thing is that a, 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 a part, given that the BJP is a party for whom uh, ideology is so key, it is so central, you know, to say many of its major decisions, whether it was the abrogation of 370, which has had a political fallout, or, uh, you know, the citizenship bill, etc. Uh, the fact is that uh, I can just uh, give a few names of some of the ministers who have come who are not from an RSS background at all. Uh, Jyotir Aditya Sindhya, who came from the Congress, Sarbanand Sonowal, who came from the originally from the ASU and AGP. Several of the Maharashtra ministers who have been inducted today come from the NCP uh, and so on. So will that dilution of ideology affect? I mean, it's a question I'm putting out. Maybe it won't. But in the past, it has. Uh, I remember when Kalyan Singh became the chief minister of Uttar Pradesh in the early 90s, uh, people from the Congress and other political parties just flocked to it. In, in the end, that was the undoing of the BJP at that period. Of course, the BJP subsequently uh, recouped and uh, ha has grown uh, uh, you know, uh, a great deal since then. So these are some of the things that uh, really uh, struck me because a lot of what is being said today, the narrative is coming from the BJP, you know, that it's a mixture of youth and experience and expertise. But in the final analysis, and this is something uh, as someone who, uh, you know, has seen so many uh, swearing in ceremonies, uh, you know, over the last two, three, two, three decades, Every time there's a major exercise, whichever government, whether it's yeah. BJP, Congress, uh, these same uh, kind of things are put out by the party about, you know, how it's this new look, um, greater representation is going to somehow yeah. miraculously turn the government around. I mean, one wishes that it would turn the government around. One major, uh, no, fair, one fair last point. major thing. No, fair one point. Last fair point. point. Ha, ha. One, one last point I wanted to make, which I think is very significant, is I don't know what is the total number of ministers uh, finally, but I think it's 70, it's uh, something 70 odd or 60, between 65 and 70. Out of that, 47. 77. 77. Yeah. Out of 77, 47 
are from the scheduled caste OBCs and scheduled tribes. I think this is something probably a first. Yes. And and that yes. uh, this social engineering will certainly you know, send out a major political message, uh, you know, to I, many I states. To, to, will, 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 yeah. I I just so so Amanda, so uh, let I, me, yes. I, let me let me just. Yeah. I just wanted to say that yeah, yeah, in come, response come in, come to what Smita that. said, just, I, I just said that I'm increasingly calling it the Bharatiya Janata Congress now because this whole inclusive style of building in a social coalition is what Congress used to be in the good old days. So to some extent, BJP has, at least on the face of it, sidelined or cold storaged some of its um, more dominant caste-oriented, uh, more strident nationalistic posture for a more down-to-earth approach to politics. That's why I call it the Bharatiya Janata Congress now. That's pr provided I mean, we'll the functioning becomes democratic. We'll have to see if that's the case, or if the new, or if the new, or if the new ministers are, are completely in sync. Because even all of the members who join the BJP yeah. are completely in sync with their vision. Yeah. Uh, there is no huge, you know, umbrella kind of situation where everyone's marching to their own tune. That doesn't really happen in the BJP politically. But Amitabh Tiwari, exactly. I wanted to come to you on the caste equations and the state representation that we are seeing. I mean, let no one be fooled that Uttar Pradesh 2022 is not on the horizon when these decisions were being made. And that can be seen uh, fairly clearly. So what are those considerations which are playing out? The fact that there are uh, prominent leaders from Maharashtra who are on board, the fact that Karnataka has been given so much importance? Yeah, see, the, the next year, uh, seven states are going to elections, out of which six in six, BJP is in power. So all of the all of these states have got representation in the new cabinet, Uttar Pradesh being the largest, of course, uh, except for Goa and Punjab. See, Punjab BJP does not have much chance, so it has not put in any minister from Punjab. So what has happened over the years is that the BJP has been able to shed its image of an upper caste and a Baniya party. So now it it has been getting a significant chunk of votes of the OBCs, as well as it has been winning majority of the SC and ST reserved seats. So as Mitaji pointed out, now the ministry has, 60% of the ministry is accounted for by OBCs, SCs and STs. So now it's a clear message that this political party, which is the BJP, is a true representative of the backwards and the Dalits. Uh, what has also been kept in mind is that the Uttar Pradesh election is going to be a big election which B BJP cannot afford to lose. So it has put in uh, eight ministers from that state. It has also tried to accommodate some allies like the Apnadal, which have not been earlier accommodated, to give a message to some of the non yaga OBC caste like Kurmis. So there has been a clear uh, representation from all the caste groups, which are the anchor voting segments of the BJP. Gujarat is also another election which is going to be important next year and six ministers are from Gujarat. Even Karnataka, as you mentioned, uh, in 2023, it will be an important election and uh, three to four ministers are, are from Karnataka. So, of course, the uh, elections have been kept in mind because unless you win the election, you will not be able to implement your agenda or your ideology. Uh, but what is striking for me, one of the most important things is that the government was not operating at full capacity. This is what the government realized because it had 28 vacancies. Most of the ministers had two to three portfolios. So only 65% capacity utilization, if you call it, was happening in the earlier ministry. So now the ministry is full. Now it is almost 95% capacity utilization in a post-COVID era, you need more hands on the deck. So this minimum uh, government, maximum governance uh, has sort of taken a backseat. And that is what is the strength of Modi in a sense, that he uh, yeah. takes cognizance of, of the feedback and has the pulse of the people in hand. So now there are more ministries, mm -hmm. now there are more hands. And just like individuals and corporates, who in the post-pandemic world have had to go through a reboot or a reset, the government has also chosen to do the same. Yes, but 
you know, the question is, what are you going to do with all of these new tal uh, this new talent which has come in? Uh, Yashwan Deshmukh, this is truly an HR issue uh, right now. You have all of this new talent which has come in. And Smita is right that every government tries to, you know, bump it up a bit by saying that, see, that we have young people, technocrats. But in this case, we've put out the facts and numbers. There are truly interesting people who've made the cut. Uh, my question is, how are you going to utilize them well enough in a system where most of the prominent decision making flows from the Prime Minister's office? Well, I don't think there is going to be much change in that. That is largely going to remain the same. But however, uh, the issue of uh, one minister having multiple departments, that should be uh, done away with. I think uh, with the 67 members, I think uh, uh, there is enough uh, human resource now over there uh, to 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 properly uh, distribute the portfolios and and keeping in mind the different kind of expertise that uh, uh, these union ministers are uh, having in the experience. Uh, I I genuinely believe that uh, that they can probably do the job much better. However, uh, you know we we started with this uh, looking at this exercise as a firefighting uh, exercise uh, to take away the issue of. Uh, of plummeting ratings or the discontent because of the mishandling of the COVID second wave. Uh, but this certainly has gone way beyond the uh, firefighting exercise. And as Smita correctly mentioned, you know, uh, 2014 onward, in fact, 2014 itself was a mandate where the core uh, support base of BJP shifted from the upper caste to the bottom of the pyramid, consisting the scheduled caste as well as the OBC group. I can give you just one example, uh, you know, Tamana. When at the peak of the temple movement in 1991, uh, when Kalyan Singh became the chief minister for Uttar Pradesh, BJP polled hardly about uh, 31, 32 percent of votes. And uh, now at the last election, Lok Sabha election, BJP almost got 50 percent votes. So from the peak of the Hindutva movement, BJP polled more than 20, almost about 20 percent more votes in 2017 or 2019. And that vote has clearly come from the bottom of the pyramid. So that pyramid has actually got inverted completely in our understanding. And largely now the BJP is the party of the OBCs and the Dalits for all practical matters. You know, no matter what uh, analysts write as far as the anger of the so-called anger of the Brahmins in Uttar Pradesh is concerned and like that and so on and so forth, they forget that first of all, uh, those numbers actually do not matter much anymore because the composition of the BJP vote bank or the uh, or composition of the Modi support base is everything different what people are used to analyze 20 years back or maybe even 10 years back. So this exercise today is completely mirroring what the support base of BJP and Mr. Modi is at this point of time. And in mirroring that support base, they have ensured that uh, the message goes very clearly. We are not only winning by your support, but we are also ensuring that you get what you deserve. And there is a very, not very subtle, actually, very on the face kind of a message to the talents across the opposition party lines as well. You know, that uh, if there is a good talent, that it should be acquired and it should be given it's due space and due uh, whatever is required because Himanta Biswasarma being promoted uh, as the chief minister, Suvendu Adhikari being promoted as the leader of opposition, and today mother of Sindhya being given what it's due to him. I think the message is now there for all the uh, Sachin pilots in the world that this is a party which can, which which is going to honor what you deserve, and the very clear message. For the BJP old timers that, you know, just because you are loyal to the party, just because you are in the party for so long, doesn't mean you are going to get everything even if you do not perform. And that is a very strong message. Uh, I, I, I don't think in, in 70, uh, 70 plus years of Indian democracy, uh, uh, apart from what might have happened during the K. Kamraj plan, these many cabinet ministers have been removed in one go. It has never happened. And that 
that gives a very strong message for the youth. You see, the core support base of uh, Mr. Modi's 2019 onward plan is is the youth, the females. Look at the number of females that have been inducted, and at the same time, uh, they have not really diluted any of the ideological core issues. Ram Mandir has been delivered, I mean, sort of in a way. I mean, it will be delivered very soon. 370 is done and dusted. Triple talaq is done. I think they will be moving forward to the uh, uniform civil code issue pretty soon. So those things are not being diluted, not being compromised. Yet the entire social engineering is making the BJP yeah. a party of the OBC and the Dalits and the bottom uh, uh, of the pyramid. And that is a huge change. That is a uh, huge socio-economic you know, political change just, that political India has seen. No, that is that is that is correct. BJP's base has widened, and they have made a, a concerted effort to widen the representation in this council of ministers when uh, the party is putting out its messaging it's also trying to highlight the fact that there are different kind of people in this council of ministers but i want to come to the question of performance and sanjeev shivasa this is a question that has been playing on my mind so everyone's saying that this is perform or perish right the 12 ministers have possibly been shown the door because they did not perform what exactly is that performance criteria? I mean, as far as the health ministry is concerned, it's pretty straightforward. The one would argue that if the government is saying they've handled the pandemic well, then why have you removed the entire team that was taking care of health? But what, in your view, is the parameter that shows non-performance? We can only begin to guess. I think uh, while everybody has concentrated so much on COVID and the uh, perceived and real failure of government on that score, and the criticism it has invited. What has largely gone unnoticed is uh, how, how the judiciary has also changed over the past few months and how there have been a number of decisions uh, which were not there in the preceding three, four, five years. So suddenly from one kind of a judiciary, you are seeing a more, uh, what some people may describe as a more proactive or more... Uh, more different judiciary. Let's not play with many, try and play with many words vis-a-vis -vis judiciary. So a new look judiciary, uh, which the government is uncomfortable with or not too comfortable with, has also been one reason why some of them, some of the portfolios have been changed. Because till the time, till a few months back or till about a year back, the government and judiciary relations were pretty good. You know, everybody kind of thought that, okay, the, the judiciary was, in according to many, playing ball. Suddenly that has changed, not to the degree that one, uh, that's confrontational, but in today's time and age, even this much of uh, a judicial activism or intervention was seen by many in the government as something which they were not expecting. So I think a very key issue will be so, who will be dealing, interacting, engaging with the judiciary from the government side? Will it be Bhupendra Yadav? I think in political terms, in terms of political heft, mm -hmm. he's the most important man who has been sworn in today, not the Vaishna or Jyotiraditya Sindhya. They are, yes, important and they deserved it. But the political messaging-wise, Bhupendra yeah, Yadav yeah. is the closest agreed, agreed. to uh, Prime Minister and Amit Shah. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are a number of questions which come up because he's also in charge of, he's definitely going to get an important portfolio. He's also election in charge for Gujarat, which goes to polls next year. And will he continue to be uh, doing that job also? Most likely, yes, because he enjoys the confidence of both the top Gujarati uh, leaders. So that's, that is one key thing. On the issue of uh, really the other point some of the, my co-panelists are making as to will the BJP's core ideology be diluted because it is co-opting so many from different parts of the political spectrum. I think those days are well behind. The only party really is either left or BJP which has any some ideology. Other people are just fair weather uh, flyers and players. They'll be happy to sing the tune whichever is given to them and they'll dance to it very happily as long as they are getting their power perks. That's why they have come in the first place. So there is no ideological baggage which, uh, with all respects to everybody who is crossing over, they really 
हैव नो दैट काइंड ऑफ अ कंपल्शन तो व्हाट इट सीए हैपेंस और व्हाट इज समथिंग हैज हैपेंस वी हैव डन पॉलिटिक्स ऑफ अ डिफरेंट काइंड ऑल आवर लाइफ्स दैट्स नो लॉन्गर द इशू अदरवाइज दे वुड हैव नो क्रॉसओवर एंड दैट इज व्हाई even at the worst of sanjeev time, what be, what sanjeev, sanjeev what there, i asked i asked madhavan a little the earlier in the show no, no, sanjeev i asked madhavan uh, a little earlier in the show no no i asked madhavan a little earlier in the show to uh, you know give his list of who does he think should get which ministry uh, why don't you do the same why, tell us where do you think these new faces should be best utilized you talked about a bupendra yadav do you see him in law what are the other combinations do you think would work of course you know the caveat oh. here this is all kite flying no one knows what uh, prime minister modi is planning to do we are hearing all sorts of names but we'll hold off till we know for sure but in the interim sanjeev what is your take what would be the best use of this pool of talent now See the one person I'll be keenly waiting as to what he gets is the um, Mr. Vaishnav, who has this uh, impeccable educational uh, background credentials and also has some experience of administration because he was in the civil services. You know, Tamanna is panelist. We speak out of turn. We sometimes shoot off our mouth also. We sometimes get it wrong also. But to try and figure out who will get which portfolio in the Narendra Modi cabinet. you know i have i have better ways of making a fool of myself in public so i won't even like to as begin to hazard a guess <laughs> because even if my guess was right it will be changed overnight you know because this government is so uh, yeah. you know, forget me for you i can't find a better way so stuck up with secrecy that even if somebody guesses it right because it will be a pure guess nobody knows so that guess will also be proved wrong <laughs> by the time the uh, the ink is dry on oh, that okay case. so i'm not asking no, you to guess possible. let's let's but let's let's do sure. this a little intelligently uh, i'm smita, sure yeah smita jyotira jyotira no, my, my point, jyotira point is how do you use your talent pool yeah i think okay see, just very I, quickly. I, i i think yeah i think the uh, economic reforms no no i'm going to smita now sanjeev okay. i have okay. to go to smita right. since since you you've lost the chance for now i'll come back to you smita let me come to you what do you think would be the best uh, utilization of the talent pool you have like mr vaishnav uh, he recently spoke about uh, uh, how uh, he believes the way to reboot the economy to revive the economy is not through giving uh, consumers more to spend or citizens more to spend but through investment so he has a clear view on that part we know rajiv chandrashekhar um, you know would be perhaps a good fit with it especially in the middle of the storm we are seeing with twitter facebook etc uh, what are the other very obvious choices and uh, fits that you could see see i i'm not going to hazard names but i can tell you how i think the decisions may be taken um it, 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 as citizens all of us citizens and journalists and whatever we would like the most uh, the uh, the job to fit the person or the person to fit the job the best qualified person should uh, fit the job but in politics what usually happens is if a particular portfolio is considered important then it is given to somebody who is considered politically important so if mr bhupendra yadav for instance gets law it will be not only because uh, law at the moment is a very important portfolio but also because he is politically important to the bjp you know uh, just to give you an example prakash uh, jawdekar who has been tossed out of this government people are speculating that it's because he was not able to control the media uh, especially the media abroad he wasn't able to control the message uh, now we have uh, smriti irani who held the imd ministry in the past she also did not have much success uh, maybe she used different tactics but she was merely shifted to another ministry because she was politically important because of the amethi uh, you know uh, the fact that she could win amethi that she could challenge rahul gandhi so she's politically important and prakash jawdekar has always been a rajya sabha mp um uh, 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 so i'm just saying that this they often match 
who is politically important. Rajnath Singh is a politically important person. Uh, you know, Nitin Gadkari is politically important. So those, so it is talent plus the political importance or how many votes that person can draw, either because he has a large uh, mass base or because he has a sort of caste constituency. So that's how I think jobs are handed out in government. It is not just that, you know, this guy is a damn good lawyer, so let's make him the law minister. So-and-so is an educationist, and he has set up so many schools, so let's give him the education portfolio. I don't think it works that way. But law ministry will go to someone a lot of news coming in, Madhavan. Before I come to you, the new the name yeah. of Mansukh Man Mandvia doing the rounds for health ministry. Everyone wanted to see um, who would get the health ministry uh, because in ordinary times, unfortunately, the health ministry does not get that much prominence. We are in the middle of a pandemic. There are reports that health and chemical ministry uh, will be clubbed and Mansukh Manvia uh, will get this. Um, what do you make on that? Uh, another uh, you know, news report coming in that the new cooperation ministry, which will look at um, cooperative banks as well, will be with the Home Minister Amit Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I have already... Under that? It's, uh, may I? Uh, Madhavan, Madhavan speaking now. Yeah, I think it's very significant yes. that Amit Shah will be in charge of the cooperatives because I was just saying in another show this evening that having covered agriculture and cooperation, I know that cooperatives are uh, may look soft to us in Delhi, but it's actually a politically very important uh, a department or ministry because you control a lot of rural level uh, power and resource distribution distribution centers. So it's very appropriate that Amit Shah has a lot of toys to distribute to the uh, players in rural areas. So I, it kind of confirms my belief that cooperatives are used for uh, political largesse. Maybe not in an in your face way the way Congress held loan melas. But you know, you as they say in India, calm karwa sakte hain cooperative ke through. You can get things done either sanction a loan or elect a favorite to a certain cooperative society post. There's a lot of little goodies to be handed over through cooperatives. So I think it's very significant that the home minister gets cooperatives because otherwise there is no match between the home ministry and the cooperatives as a portfolio, as a pure play economic portfolio. I don't know much about Mansukh Mandavia, but uh, this is something I did want to say. If there's something else, I wouldn't know. But to Smita's point, I want to add that yeah. this government has a PPP line, as one of the analysts put it, you know, there is performance, politics, and perception. So broadly speaking, the cabinet births go to the performers. The minister of state goes to the politics for various groups and interest groups and castes and vote bank people. And perception is in the way you drop some ministers to show that you're in command and that uh, underperformance will not be tolerated. So this is the broad theme, but we are still watching the inductees to see, as Sanjeev Srivastava brilliantly put, it's a guessing game anyway. Um, it is, uh, it is, but we, it, the clearer picture is emerging. I think we should, Smita wanted to come in. I think we should also focus on the task at hand. At the end of the day, the, the reshuffle and moving one minister to another portfolio is towards the larger goal of good governance and making sure that, uh, you know, the BJP continues with its political dominance all the way up to 2024 and survives the seven state elections which are coming up next. So in that context, Smita, what do you think the priority would be? I, I think it, it is a question of, um, I, I think if the government has made any losses in public perception, it has been uh, largely during this pandemic uh, with the large number of deaths, the number of deaths and the loss of livelihoods. So uh, that, that is really what the government really needs to correct, as well as rising prices. Uh, but whether the government will be able to, is keen on actually addressing these issues or, uh, you know, just changing the perception, because that is what this government has been very good at you know, image building, uh, you know, uh, and perception building uh, uh, about itself. Um, 
Uh, I wanted to add a bit to what Madhavan said. I agreed entirely with him on that corporate uh, that the the, the, the uh, for the reasons he has cited for the Home Minister being given the cooperative portfolio. Uh, you can see people like Sharad Pawar and uh, especially in Maharashtra, where cooperatives are very very important. How much power? It's a huge support political support base also. Apart from getting able to, the ability to get things done, it creates a huge support base. Uh, you know these uh, the, the cooperative um, movement, the cooperative banks. It, it's uh, it's massive. It's a political, uh, really, a political decision rather than economic decision. Hmm. Some more names coming in. Uh, Jitendra Singh for science uh, and technology. Uh, here, uh, railways and IT also being clubbed. So a lot of information there coming in. Uh, we'll take a very short break here on this. I want to thank all of you for joining us for the analysis. In this portion, we were discussing on what these new faces should absolutely and actually do. But before